You can go. Me? Mm -hmm. oh, hello, this is Kristen Lays. I'm from Heritage Preservation. And we're just going to wait a few minutes for a few more people to join us. Um, I hope everyone can hear us well. Um, I think just because we're into summer now, we'll just put up a little poll. We can get to know each other by talking about uh, our summer plans. Wondering if you've headed out on vacation yet or not. If you've got one coming up, I know I'm counting the days. And I think everyone has found the chat box that's to um, the left of the screen. And uh, you can type in your questions um, while we are in the middle of our presentation. And um, we'll be having this live um, Q&A time today. And uh, feel free to just put in any comments or questions you have in that chat box. Well, I'm glad to see no one needs another vacation after the vacation. Sometimes that does happen. Um, but uh, hopefully those who question, even if they're going to get one this year, will, something will come through. So thanks. Uh, let's, uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. But let's go ahead and see where everyone's coming in from today. It's just kind of nice to get, we see your cities and towns. But sometimes it's just nice to see a regional overview of where everyone's coming in from today. Southeast and Midwest. Thanks for getting up early in the West Coast. Joining us at the beginning of your day. That's great. So it looks like we have about 20 people logged in at this point. Pretty good mix of folks. See if we can get some Mountain Plains people in here, maybe coming in a little later. Great. Well, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and officially start then. And again, I'm Kristen Lays from Heritage Preservation. And I'd like to welcome you to the Connecting to Collections online community. If you hadn't joined us for our first webinar two weeks ago, then welcome to our meeting room and our ability to interact with you in a pretty, hopefully, technically seamless way. Uh, the Heritage Preservation is moderating the Connecting to Collections online community in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And the site is designed and produced by Learning Times, which is making this technology possible for us. Um, the goal of the online community is just to help smaller museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies quickly locate reliable preservation resources and network with their colleagues. Um, we know everyone is very busy. You probably wear a lot of hats at your institution. Collections care is only one of those daily activities that you have to address. And we're hoping that this um, online community will make it a little bit easier when you do have a question or a concern and you need to get to reliable information quickly. Um, about twice a month, we will be um, having a featured resource on the site. And um, we hope that this will be a particularly um, interesting or useful resource. You might want to bookmark in um, your browser for a quick reference later, or it might be, give you an opportunity to do a little bit of more reading on something you've been meaning to get to for your collection. And then, of course, we're going to try to have some type of a live question answer or some type of webinar interaction um, with, with an expert on the topic that we've featured. So today, we are welcoming Deborah Long. She is the head of Objects Conservation, uh, the Objects, Objects Conservation Laboratory at the Gerald Ard Ford Conservation Center, which is based at the Nebraska State Historical Society in Omaha. She was one of the conservators featured in the Nebraska Educational Telecommunications Program, Saving Your Treasures. The videos from this program, as well as video segments from four major distance learning workshops, have been posted on the website, along with links to other preservation resources. The funding for this program was provided in part from a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. 
Um, and it's, the site's been up for a little while, but um, we wanted to feature it again because we just think it is so useful. Um, the video components, um, here are some examples of just the ones that are just up on the, the home page of the, of the site um, on things like how to roll and fold textiles for storage, how to polish and wax silver objects, how to care for your photos. Um, are really useful um, short videos that it would be great for your staff and volunteers, but also really good to um, refer any kind of um, questions that you might get from patrons or visitors about how to care for their family heirlooms. So they've organized the site with um, types of materials and types of objects and frequent issues that these objects face and the kind of deterioration that, that comes about just because of their, their properties. Um, and so it's just a very useful overall picture of some of the conservation issues that they face. Um, so thank you so much to Deborah for joining us today. And she has a specialty in all kinds of objects, but in particular, she thought she could be helpful today with talking about metal objects. And perhaps you had a chance to see uh, two of the videos that she was featured in. Um, which is the uh, care of silver objects, including the you know, cleaning and um, polishing of silver objects and then waxing them so, that, so they can maintain um, a good condition while on display or in storage. So again, um, you'll see the chat box to the left of the screen. Um, and you're welcome to send us any comments or questions as we get going. But I'll start off with a few of my own. And hello, Deborah. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, Kristen. And um, I just wanted to, to just go over one of the main points I've always seemed to hear about silver, which is that you should be careful how often you polish them. Um, that if you polish them too often, you can lose some of the detail in them. So in, in light of that and these videos, could you give a little more background on, on that? Sure. Um, it, it really is true that you should limit how often you polish silver, uh, partly because it's such a soft metal. You really um, can take the surface right off. I mean, one of the things to remember about polishing is that even when you're using a very fine polish, it's still an abrasive. And it's still at the microstructure level. What you're really doing is grinding the surface away. So you absolutely don't want to do it too often. Um, and if you look at very old silver objects that have been polished repeatedly, what you'll see is they have a very soft, almost melted appearance in some cases. Um, if they have a lot of raised decoration on them, what you will sometimes find is that the high points have holes polished right through them. So it is something to keep in mind as you're working. You know, it seems like when you're doing it, you're, you don't get the feeling you're taking very much away. But when you repeat that process time and time again, it begins to have an effect. Right. So then the, the waxing step is important because that's going to help maintain the polished surface for, I think you said in the video, about a year um, before you might, depending on the circumstances, but before um, you would see an appearance of tarnish again. That's right. In addition to polishing causing loss of silver, um, just the fact that an object is sitting in a normal atmosphere over time, um, because almost every normal atmosphere that your object is going to sit in is going to contain at least oxygen. It's also going to contain um, varying levels of pollutants that will interact with the surface of the silver. And that interaction causes the corrosion. And for corrosion to form, silver is actually used up. And so when the silver is used up and converted from metallic silver to a silver corrosion product, and then you polish it away, you're then exposing another fresh surface that, again, will be used up, which you will polish away. And it's this repeated process that causes the loss of your surface. Oh, that, so, yeah, that helps. I'm, so I'm, uh, 
waxing the surface of the silver or putting any kind of protective coating on the surface helps to slow down that interaction with the environment and pollutants in the environment. And so that just reduces the number of times you have to repeat this process. So even if, even if an object is in storage in, in silver cloth, it's still worth um, going through this process. I would, I would say so. Um, there are lots of different ways to protect your silver. Um, and I, being a conservator, I think I'm interested in using as many of them as I, as I can that are reasonable to use. And so often I will apply that protective coating and then, as you say, put it inside silver cloth if it's on, in storage. I'll also even, uh, I usually even recommend that you take the silver cloth and put that silver cloth container inside a zip top bag so that you, again, slow down the interaction of oxygen with the surface of your object as much as you can. Right. Great. I see that they were getting a couple of different questions about supplies and tools for doing this process. And I know you mentioned some of that in the videos, but do you mind just reviewing again what kind of products you use when you do cleaning and polishing and waxing? Um, sure. Um, a lot of these uh, materials are fairly straightforward to get. You can uh, get distilled or deionized water, as I mentioned, in the grocery store or in a, a pharmacy or uh, a hardware store. Um, detergents, again, the grocery store. Um, I usually just look for something that's uh, clear and doesn't have fragrances. Um, you need very, very little of it, only about a few drops. Um, and then the polish itself, I use cal uh, precipitated calcium carbonate. And that's uh, a little bit more difficult to get. Um, I usually order that from a conservation supplier. Um, there are uh, the big chemical houses you can buy it from. But usually those quantities are, are pretty large. And if you're in a small institution, it's about a 200-year supply. So um, you, you probably want to get it from an, uh, a supplier like Talis or something like that, where you can buy a smaller quantity. Um, and then the cotton pads, you, I think I mentioned that in the video that the cotton pads I use are from the, the cubby machine industry. Um, any kind of soft cotton will do. Um, white cotton flannel is a, another option. I, I tend to like plain cotton to the extent that I can get away with it, just because it, it's, it's very usable. It's very expen inexpensive, and uh, it, it's available, pretty widely available. But this isn't just like the cotton ball you'd get at the pharmacy, which is a, isn't it, that's usually a synthetic material, right? right? So this would, would all of this basically be you know, available through Gaylord or um, Light Impressions or any of the conservation supply catalogs? I haven't checked for it through those suppliers, but you, but you could actually use a cotton ball or loose cotton okay. if you wanted to do that. You just have to make sure it is plain, clean cotton. Okay. Um, and as you say, sometimes they have synthetic materials in them, so you do just have to watch for that. It's the same if you needed to use cotton swabs. You just need to make sure it's actually cotton. OK. And then the precipitated calcium carbonate use up is a powder that yes, you have liquid to do. Right. It, it's, um, yeah, it, the bigger uh, chemical houses like Fisher Scientific sell it in, I think their smallest quantity is about three kilos. So Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> You really don't need that much. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it in Gaylord, but uh, Talas does carry it in. And how do you spell that? Quantities. It's T-A-L-A-S. OK. I can put a link up to that on the, um, on the discussion page of the website okay. so people can follow up on that. Um, so essentially, it sounds like anything you would buy um, to maybe polish your, your, you know, your household silver is not appropriate, any kind of the commercial polishes or 
well, cross or problem. anything like that, or dips, someone asked about. Yeah. Silver the, dips. Well, let's take the polishes first. OK. Um, silver polishes that are commercial um, aren't normally contain lots of materials like perfumes and dyes, because some of the materials they add to their polishes don't smell very good. Um, and I just really like to avoid all of those materials. Um, things that are used in a home environment um, that might be fine in a home environment may not be suitable for a museum environment. Uh, and I think when you're in a smaller institution, there is a very strong urge to just get something easily and quickly at the local hardware store. Um, but some of these things that are work fine in a home environment um, like corrosion inhibitors that are, are fine, like I said, for sort of silver in use, um, can cause some secondary problems over time on silver that's in a museum setting. So I really like to avoid all of those things. OK, and um, what about those, the dips? Some the dips? Um, well, some people love them. Um, the big problem with them is, really, silver was never intended for its entire surface to be stripped off. And this is the problem with a dip. Um, it will take off all of the surface, all of the discoloration, whether it was intended to be there or not. And often, if you look at silver, what you'll see is uh, you know, this difference in surface conformation um, decorative elements, engraving, things like that, um, they're meant to be dark in the depression. And when you use a dip solution, um, it's indiscriminate. It will remove everything from the surface. And so you end up with an object that looks odd. Um, it also is quite uh, an aggressive material. And so I, I like to use the gentlest thing I can. Um, certainly fast to use a dip solution. It's just you end up with an appearance that's, that's not accurate. And right. when you're in a historic setting, accuracy is what you're trying to, to maintain. I think that's one of the nice things about the video is not only do you see how you, how you handle the object, but you can also see when it's completed mm -hmm. its appearance. And that, that right, it's not, there are some, some darker areas in the, in the detail. Right. And I believe that the, the image that we have up on our home page right now also is a pretty good example of that. It is a perfect example of that. Great. And you can just imagine how that would look if there were no dark surfaces at all. It right. really, you start to lose the detail. And yeah, that makes me also feel You are now muted. Home. <laughs> <laughs> Less is better. Yeah. So someone asked about Haggerty. As a polish, uh -huh. is uh -huh. that name familiar to you? Yes, it is. It is. I see they mentioned that it looks like mud. Uh -huh. um, the reason it looks like that is it has iron oxide in it. And so a lot of the commercial polishes you'll see, they, they look pink or brownish. And this is why, because they have iron oxide in them. And the iron oxide is a very traditional polishing agent or silver. It's sometimes called rouge um, or other things like that. Um, and this is, this is perfectly fine as a polishing material. It is harder than the silver itself, though. So it will take more material away. This is another reason I like the calcium carbonate. It's, it's quite a bit softer than the iron oxide. Um, calcium carbonate's about the hardness of your fingernail. It's hard enough to remove the tarnish, but it's not hard enough to really aggressively scratch away a lot of the silver surface. Where the iron oxide is, is harder, and it, and it is more aggressive. It removes more material. And a lot of times with a commercial polish, though, they'll, they'll put that material in there because it makes your polishing go faster. So, so it makes their product more popular. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. Well, um, someone asked also what, what about the bags. Um, so I guess that the silver cloth is something you can purchase, I think, pretty readily through the um, conservation suppliers. Right. Or you can, and you can make your And you can make your own or yes. just use it to wrap. 
if you have an odd shaped object, you can just get a, a length of it to wrap it. You you can you can um, it's um, you can buy it on the web too, um, just in bolts or you know by the square yard or something like that. Um, it's quite easy to sew. It's basically a soft cotton flannel that's been treated with uh, actually finely divided metal particles that are entrained in the fibers. And what happens with these silver cloth bags is over time, your object is on the inside. The pollutants are outside in the air. And as the air filters through that cotton flannel cloth, it interacts with those finely divided particles. And so the pollutants are kind of used up by the time they get inside the bag where your object is. And that's the way it works. So it has a finite lifespan. Um, and once those particles are all used up, then the bag doesn't work anymore as okay. a protective environment for your object. Um, and so for that reason, you never want to wash silver cloth. Oh, OK. That's good to know. Those, yeah, those little particles will be washed out. Right. Uh, and how, do you have any kind of range of time of how, how long a, a silver cloth container might last? It's a pretty long time. Okay. I think that I think the average time is about fifteen to twenty years. Oh, okay, that's so, great. Yeah, it's, it, so it, it, people often ask, "Is it worth it?" Because it's kind of expensive. But I, I right. would say yes. Yeah. Well, and then so you said to put, wrapping the object in the silver cloth, but then also putting it into a, a zip bag, a plastic bag of some kind. Will that right. also extend the life of the silver cloth? Yes, it will, because what's happening when you're putting it inside a zip top bag, and, and you do want to stick with the food grade polyethylene bags okay. or something like that, um, it, it, for the same reason you don't want to introduce another pollutant or possible pollutant. So if you put all, your silver cloth and your object inside the zip top bag, it just slows down the transmission rate of, of oxygen from the air and the pollutants that are in the air. And everything is just slowed down. And so there's a slower rate of interaction with the silver cloth and a slower rate of interaction with your artifact. And therefore, everything lasts a little bit longer. Right. So um, so it's food grade, that's a good point. And then I've also understood that if, you, if it smells like plastic, strongly of plastic, then it's not safe for a museum object. Well, we do really try to avoid things like polyvinyl chloride. And if you you might remember this from when you were a kid, that sort of new baby doll smell. Right. That kind of vinyl smell. You definitely want to avoid that, um, anything polyvinyl chloride. Um, and you want to stick with clean food grade polyethylene or clean polypropylene. Those are, those are two plastics that you, you can use safely. Great. And then mylar, which is essentially a polyester. Right. Um, a, one more question on the polishing. What about the silver polishing cloth? Someone, someone mentioned um, a brand called Burke's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A um, lot of the polishing cloth um, is, is essentially a, a cotton flannel that, just like the silver cloth, it has metal particles entrained in it. Um, sometimes you'll look at these polishing cloths. They'll be brown or, or, or something like that. That may be because they also may have iron oxide particles actually entrained in the fibers. And so just the fact that there's an abrasive mixed with the fibers in the cloth means that when you rub it over the surface of your silver, since the iron oxide is harder than the silver, it will essentially rub some of the silver away. And when they're not orange or brown or something like that, it may be that there's another abrasive in there, like aluminum oxide, cerium oxide. There are different um, abrasives on the market. But a lot of those polishing cloths contain this kind of finely divided abrasive. And so just the rubbing action of rubbing that abrasive surface across your silver will rub some of the surface off of it, okay. which is how they work. 
Right. So again, a little more aggressive than you should probably be for a museum object. They can be. They yeah. can be. Okay. Yeah. One of the ways I um, sometimes suggest if people have something they're not really sure of and they, and they don't know if they can use it, especially for a home environment, if, it, if they're talking with their patrons, you can say if they rub it across a little piece of plexiglass, if it scratches the plexiglass, it, it's possible that it might scratch your object. OK, that's a good test. I think that's a really good test. Well, what I'll do is um, see if we can do a little more research on sourcing some of these materials and uh, see if we can put that out on the discussion page so that people can have that handy. Um, I just wanted to, a couple, we had, looks like we had a couple questions of storage for silver. So, and this sort of segues into a question I also had. You know, sometimes, in, especially in a historic site or house environment, this, you really want to display the silver. Um, and it's possible that there could be silver in stored in cabinets or furniture that are in a house or even out as a, as a place setting. So I guess that's two questions. One, um, are there, so obviously if it's on display in a storage cabinet, you, would, you wouldn't want it wrapped in silver cloth. Right. So do you have any tips about that? And then secondly, you know, what if you wanted to display silver candlesticks with candles in it or a fruit bowl with um, something in it? You know, do you have any tips for how to protect the silver in those cases? I do. Um, depending on what the cabinetry is like, there are several things you can do for objects displayed behind glass. Um, and of course, this depends on the historic furniture they're using. Uh, sometimes you can put down um, on the shelf itself that the silver is sitting on. You could put a piece of microchamber four ply um, or something like that. And that will adsorb pollutants from inside of the cabinet. Uh, 3M makes some activated carbon strips that help, again, adsorb pollutants inside the cabinet. Um, when I have anything in a historic house setting, I, I tend to recommend to people that they have a conservator actually professionally apply a clear lacquer coating to those artifacts because they are so exposed, um, whether they're in a cabinet or whether they're out you know, on a dining table or something like a sideboard setting. Um, I really do recommend that they have a conservator do this kind of coating. Because otherwise, what happens is, it, as long as it's on view, people are breathing, cars are driving, you know, pollutants are there in the environment. And so the objects are exposed to these pollutants. Because they need to keep them looking nice, they polish them a lot. And so applying a, having a professional protective coating applied in this kind of circumstance really helps maintain your objects for a lot longer period of time. So that, that's my normal recommendation for um, museum settings. Um, when you have objects that are out in that room setting, uh, you can also apply little strips of barriers. Like you could cut a tiny little strip of mylar and put it around the candle so that it's not in direct contact with the inside of the candle cup. If you have uh, candles in a candlestick. Right. Um, if you have uh, a room setting where you want to put some uh, flower arrangement of silk flowers or something like that, um, you can, again, put some kind of mylar barrier in there. You could also use the clean polyethylene sheeting. It's a little softer, and it goes in the rounder surface areas a little bit more easily. So that's that's something you can do in a in a historic house setting too, and I would still recommend that even if the object has a protective coating on it, um, right? Because you don't you certainly don't want to spend the time and effort and money to have that protective coating applied and then accidentally scratch it off. True, that's a good point. Okay, just two more questions on silver, and then we'll move on to to other metals, but. Um, I guess one question came from Susan in Tampa about um, a plastic uh, 
silver bag that she got from University Products. She said it's mm -hmm. gold colored. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with those? It's, I'm guessing it's something called corrosion intercept. Um, that is actually polyethylene sheeting that it works in kind of the same way that the silver cloth works. Basically, it has finely divided copper actually mixed with the polyethylene. And so it works in the same way as the silver cloth as oxygen diffuses through the bag and the pollutants diffuse through the bag. Um, the copper, that finely divided copper actually chemically interacts with the pollutants and sort of they get used up instead of having it attack the object inside the bag. Right. So this would just eliminate maybe buying two things, a silver cloth and, a, and then a plastic bag if you just purchase this one. Yes. Yes. I would, I would say if you do something like that, you, you probably, um, uh, well, I might be more paranoid than that. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, just, maybe a little bit more. <laughs> oh, I see. OK. Well, yeah, it's better to, to be on the safe side. Well, um, that's my nature. <laughs> yeah, I understand. And then just another quick question. Um, the um, Claire in St. John was saying that, that they seem to like the polishing cloth because it would avoid an issue where there was residue polish le left in, in the nooks and crannies. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but as you said, um, if you could test the silver polish cloth on a piece of plexiglass and see if it scratches, that that's a good test, but I mean, what, what do you think are the pros and cons? Well, I would say firstly, if you're leaving some polished residues, you haven't finished the job. <laughs> right. So, um, so you really do, if you're going to polish silver, you need to spend enough time to actually get it on effectively and get all of it off. Um, one of the things that makes um, metal objects, something of a challenge to deal with is the fact that they will interact in ways you don't even think about with the environment. And one of the ways they will interact is um, through these tiny particles that are left behind. So if you leave polish of any kind behind, um, the, any kind of, well, any kind of abrasive particles or even dust that's sitting on the surface will have a, a large surface area. And that large surface area actually attracts moisture to it. And that causes a sort of localized, elevated relative humidity. And that water is available to help further the process of corrosion. So it's really important when you polish that you actually clean off all of that polish residue and so this might involve using some cotton swabs and a little bit of distilled or deionized water to get everything out of those little nooks and crannies that you might need some soft, uh, stable paint brushes or things like that to help kind of dust that residue out of there. But it is important to get, get as much out as possible. Right. Of, of course, that means more time and more effort, um, which is one of the reasons I tend to recommend that they have conservators take care of this for them, because it gives them about 15 or 20 years of not having to deal with this stuff. Right, and so that would be giving it to a conservator to, to be polished and then to be coated in something stronger than wax. That would yes. Be, yeah. Um, and I'll just put up right now um, that the um, American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works is a place where you can find a conservator and search by type of material and search by geography. Um, if anybody on the call hasn't used that resource, it's a very handy way to find a conservator and talk to a conservator. Um, just, to, while we're, just to move on to some other types of metal, I mean, we've talked about polishing and cleaning of silver. I mean, are these the same basic principles for other types of metal, like copper or brass, bronze or pewter? Are there, are there specific things to those types of metals that, that you need to be really aware of? I think so. If you're in a historic house setting and you have uh, copper, brass, or bronze, or any of those copper alloys, um, what you have to be sure of when you're working with them is what was their original intended surface? A lot of these copper alloys are 
are meant to have a slightly patinated surface. And patina can be a natural darkening of the surface over time. Or it could be an intentionally applied patina that actually is meant to make the surface look a little bit darker. So uh, understanding what it is that you're looking at and what it was supposed to look like is, is really important before you just decide you're going to polish it and make it look all shiny and new. Because it may not ever have been intended to look that way. Right. right. So a lot of times, a, a more straightforward recommendation might be to simply clean the surface carefully and apply a wax coating just to protect it so that it can kind of maintain its existing appearance. Right, right. Um, and someone mentioned too, I mean, what if, what if you have um, composite objects? So we have some type of metal in the same object as wood or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. stone or minerals. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a common issue. Uh, and at that place, you're starting to look at the interaction of multiple types of materials. And sometimes you have a situation called inherent vice, where the needs of one part of your artifact actually conflict with the needs of another part of your, of your object. Um, so for example, if you have, a, I don't know, a steel knife that might have an ivory handle, for example. Um, the ivory likes a little bit higher relative humidity environment, but the higher relative humidity will actually start to cause corrosion for the iron component. Um, in that case, you're a little bit limited. And a lot of composite artifacts have this problem, which is why conservators have such a strong tendency to ask um, museums to try to be careful with their environment. It helps protect all the artifacts. And if you can kind of stabilize your relative humidity, at least any of this competition that's going on will be at the minimum rate of speed. Right. And then I've, I've also heard, um, especially in smaller institutions or, or institutions such as archives and libraries that have, you know, human comfort to think about people coming in the door, but they also might have a handful of museum type objects that uh, you can get a lot of benefits from, from doing micro environments. So even making sure that that object is housed properly in a box. Right. Um, right. Or in a if, case. In a case, right. So mm -hmm. even if you're, you're working hard to stabilize your relative humidity, but it's not ideal yet, you can. Right. Are there any other t tips on? I mean, we talked about silver cloth for silver items. You know, in the case of your ivory and steel knife, mm -hmm. how would you house that? Well, that's a place again where you're uh, you you want to make sure the object is very clean, as I mentioned before, because you don't want to have interaction from from dust or the pollutants that are in dust, um, but. You, if you can kind of keep your relative humidity in the about 40 to 45 percent range, um, really kind of trying to keep it in that middle range is, is really the best thing you can do. And trying to keep it stable so that it's not kind of flexing from high to low relative humidity is, is just about as important as keeping it at a good relative humidity. Um, for storage, um, keeping things in storage boxes or protected in, uh, I really like storage boxes, actually, um, because they really kind of do provide a little microclimate. And the box itself provides a certain amount of buffering from changes in the relative humidity. And a lot of small institutions have more trouble trying to maintain a stable relative humidity. So things in storage that are in acid-free, lignin-free boxes will be, will have a little bit of buffer from these, the speed of these changes. Right. So we talked about um, using calcium carbonate for cleaning of silver tarnish. Silver tarnish. I mean, would you, mm -hmm. could you use that for other metals, too? Um, Bev had asked about um, a copper 
an object with copper alloy on it. Right. Um, polishes copper is a little bit harder than silver, and so calcium carbonate may not be a hard enough polish to remove very much. Of course, depending on the appearance, you may not want to remove very much. Um, if all you want to do is clean it, you could clean it in the same sort of way with a little bit of distilled or deionized water and some um, a very weak detergent solution followed by more rinsing in distilled or deionized water and drying carefully. Um, sometimes that's all you need. It, um, what you'll finally, what you find sometimes, particularly with um, candlesticks or things like that, is they'll have wax residues in the bottom of them. Often when you look into those candle cups, it looks like, it always looks like they used green candles in there. They really didn't use green candles. Um, often what you're seeing is a particular type of copper corrosion product called uh, stearate corrosion. And usually it's from an interaction with the candle itself and the wax, the wax type in the candle. Um, so that can be cleaned off with a little bit of mineral spirits. Okay. And again, you know, then I would again go back and and wash it a little bit, rinse it, You'll make dry sure it thoroughly. Know. Yeah. Um, so, um, Stefana said she had had some trouble with eliminating old polish residue from brass. Mm -hmm. And it can the, be very hard. And the Orvis and distilled water and ethanol weren't quite doing the trick, but maybe mineral right. spirits could be something she could try. It might be. A lot of, of polishes, commercial polishes, a lot of times have waxes in them or mixed with them um, to kind of, again, make things go faster. And so if you leave that in the depressions over a long period of time, you end up with this polish residue that's mixed with wax and the mineral spirits should help dislodge that a little bit. Of course, wax isn't water soluble and uh, it's not very easily disturbed with ethanol either. But the mineral spirits, she might have a little bit better luck with that. Okay, and again, the mineral spirits we you would maybe buy at the hardware store, you need to just make sure that they don't have additional right. additives. Like. Right, right. You want it to be plain mineral spirits. Um, and if you're using any solvents, mineral spirits or ethanol, you do want to be very careful about where you're working. Um, those are both flammable solvents, um, so you don't want to have any problems like that. They also can be harmful to your health, of course, if you're breathing them in a closed environment. Um, so when you're doing things like that, do please take as many precautions as you can to protect your health and to protect your institution from a fire. OK, great. So environment in keeping the air clean and the relative humidity stable is, seems very important in terms of avoiding corrosion on metal. So Janine has tossed out an interesting question. Um, she is saying that they are considering a request to do a fog machine with dry ice for a Halloween event. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe Janine can tell us a little bit more about how exposed her objects are at the, at the place where this fog machine or dry ice might be used. Is, um, does that sound like a really bad idea? Well, or I, I, it depends on what the fog machine is, is emitting. Um, dry ice is carbon dioxide, is frozen carbon dioxide. But some of those fog machines don't work with dry ice. Some of them work with other um, chemicals that create the fog. So I would definitely want to know exactly what was going out there from the fog machine. Um, it doesn't seem like something you would necessarily want to do in the museum. Um, I, Boy, that's a, that's a temper. Carbon dioxide shouldn't hurt anything. It, it is extremely cold, though, so it could be a handling problem. Um, it's kind of dangerous to handle. You, you have to have pretty sturdy gloves to handle it. And um, Yeah, you need a professional. <laughs> yeah, it's a good <laughs> idea. 
Yeah, yeah so I guess it just depends too on how exposed the, the artifacts are in this particular in the particular space where this exactly. might be used, and if it could be right. used in, a, in the lobby or someplace where yeah, there are no objects. Further. Exactly, exactly. That right. would be the, the safer outside thing. the front door as people are entering <laughs> right. to give give the appearance the effect, but not any harm. Yes, exactly. So that that's a great question. Um, I was just wondering too, and thinking about metal objects, and maybe this is really obvious, um, and I should know the answer, but uh, I noticed in the video you were wearing um, a type of a latex glove or a plastic glove as opposed to a mm -hmm. white cotton mm -hmm. glove. And I know in handling metals, one of the big hazards is any kind of any kind of oils or or, or any um, dirt or anything that would come from human handling. So I, I just was curious, you know, I've always heard in museum work use white cotton gloves, but I noticed you were wearing a plastic glove. Do you want to explain sure, the, sure. Sort of what you prefer and what the advantages are of different things? Absolutely. Um, you, ha you do have a lot of choices when you're handling artifacts in a museum setting, um, but it is true you, you generally don't want to handle metal objects with your bare hands. Um, your skin does, even very clean skin, um, has oils and salts on it to, to keep your skin safe. Um, but those things interact very poorly with metals. Um, and so, so that's why people do say wear white cotton gloves. Um, when I'm doing work like this with an artifact, um, you probably noticed in that video, everything gets kind of black and gross after a while. Um, certainly, that would suck into the cotton of a cotton glove, and it would be useless in, in very short order. Um, I tend to use latex gloves when I'm working, um, powder-free latex. Uh, it, they have a very close fit, and they will protect you from the abrasives and the, the dirty water and the, the soap. And if you use any other solvents, it will help protect you from those as well. Um, the thing you have to watch out with the latex gloves is some people do have latex allergies, so that's something you want to be sure about before you bring latex into your organization. Um, and then your other option would be a nitrile glove. Uh, nitrile gloves can be very useful. The only problem with them is once in a while they can be processed with a chlorine rinse. And chlorine is something you don't want against your silver or copper alloys okay. um, because it will cause another type of corrosion. Uh, so I, I tend to stick with the latex gloves. They're inexpensive. They're very easy to get. And they're clean. You, you get actually quite a bit safer handling, I feel, when you use clean latex gloves because, they, because they're not knitted or woven. There's no possibility of them nagging on some kind of sharp corner or edge or something like that. And I feel much safer when I handle things with, with them. Um, the cotton gloves, unfortunately, people always have the best of intentions that they're going to keep them nice and clean. But I'm sure everybody in the museum world has seen the kind of cotton gloves that nobody actually wants to put their hands in. Right, much right. Less such an object with. <laughs> right. Right, and you do have to. And when you do wash them, you need to sort of follow certain protocols, too, to make sure you're not washing them with a, a detergent that would leave right. a residue. And um, it, seemed, it seems to me that, it, from what I've been hearing, that the move to powder-free latex gloves is, is useful for a lot of different types of objects. It, it is. And then and there's not, the nitrile is also very popular. Yeah, and those are the blue. They tend, yes. tend to be blue in color, right? Yeah, blue, purple, green. Uh huh. Come in all colors, right? So okay. So again, it's just again late watching those labels and, and getting information on. Yeah, making sure that it hasn't been treated. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you're not sure, one of the things you you could do it, it's not a uh, it's not a really official test, but you could if you have a little piece of silver or copper, you could simply wrap that little piece of, like a, if you have any little test coupons or anything like that, you could wrap a little glove around one of those little coupons and stick it in a clean jar and just 
come back in a week and see what it looks like. Right. Just just to, to try to see what you can find out on your own if you're not sure or you're the seller of your nitrile gloves isn't sure. Right. So uh, we've heard back from Janina Naltuna and her her Halloween um, fog machine dry ice question. She explains that they're large objects. So metal, plaster, wood, so may not be able to be moved out of the space. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the case, then she probably wants to be more, I would hesitate to say use um, carbon dioxide in a basement, because you just don't want, it, it's not, it doesn't seem like it would have a good escape route. Right. And I right. wouldn't want to use anything that created any kind of smoke. Usually those smoke things are proprietary, and they often won't tell you what's in them because they're proprietary materials. Right. And I know they always seem to have an odor whenever I've seen them used. So that yes. tells you already that it's got, mm -hmm. it's got something bad is coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah. Janine, it's not looking good. <laughs> Maybe some effect with lighting. <laughs> there the you go. <laughs> or an event space. <laughs> right, or an event space. Um, Stefana has asked us a question about corrosion and corrosion inhibitors. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I guess maybe it's a very broad question on sort of how do you recognize corrosion, mm -hmm. um, and then sort of so say you see it, and then now what do you do? Mm -hmm. And is it too late to use a corrosion inhibitor? Is a corrosion inhibitor something that that just museum staff are able to use, or is that something they might need to consult with a conservator on? Well. Corrosion inhibitors come in a variety of forms. I mean, some of this preservation we've been talking about already is a form of inhibiting corrosion. Um, using the silver cloth is, is corrosion inhibiting just by exclusion, essentially. Um, some other corrosion inhibitors uh, come in a vapor phase. And there are products on the market that are, are actually called vapor phase corrosion inhibitors. Usually they're papers that evolve gases that help inhibit corrosion. Um, those are fairly specialized applications. Um, I wouldn't think that would be something you would normally find in a museum storage area. Um, if you have too much of that corrosion inhibitor, it can kind of attach to the surface and discolor the surface of metal objects in some cases. It kind of depends on volume. Um, but if you're trying to figure out if you're having corrosion, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, corrosion is always happening, whether you can see it or not, um, unless you have an environment that has no oxygen and no relative humidity. Okay, uh, that's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> corrosion just happens. Um, the way you can kind of see it, any a tarnish is a type of corrosion. It's oxidation, um, simple oxidation. Uh, it, what people often will worry about is uh, kind of more the, the sort of rapidly developing corrosion, like you see sometimes on archaeological objects. Uh -huh. um, and that will sometimes look powdery, or it will actually you know, form in and, a and sort of fluffy mass and fall off of your object. Um, that's, if you see something like that on a metal object, you probably want to get in touch with a conservator um, because something is probably going on with your artifact. And, and rather than just guess or try to do something yourself, you may be better off just having a conservator have a look at it and try to figure out what's going on with it. Uh, because it could be um, an, any number of, of different causes. So kind of it's hard to say in a blanket case what you should do. It, right. it, there are so many possibilities, it, it's kind of difficult to answer that question. And so what about, what about this, as you mentioned, archaeological artifacts? Or mm -hmm. what about pieces that come into the collection where it's got visible, active 
Active corrosion. corrosion. Well, again, that's, that's some place where you're going to want a conservator to um, interact with your artifact because uh, there are some particular types of corrosion on copper alloys. In particular, there's uh, a very destructive corrosion product called, that is called bronze disease um, that is basically multiple unstable forms of corrosion. And you, in order to stop that, you have to have a conservator carry out uh, conservation treatment. Um, again, like I said, unless you can provide a less than 10% relative humidity environment or zero right. oxygen environment. Right. Um, and that's, a, that's bronze disease is a corrosion product that because both phases are unstable, it doesn't stop until the bronze is all gone. So, so you definitely want to have the conservator looking at that. There are also salt-based corrosion problems that will sometimes happen with iron collections um, from uh, burial environments that have soluble salts. Um, they can cause these corrosion problems that are very disfiguring on iron-based materials, archaeological materials. And uh, what you'll see in those cases is kind of, again, a voluminous uh, sort of corrosion product that will sometimes, if your object is sitting on a shelf on a white background, for example, you'll, you'll see a kind of iron oxide powder around the object. Um, again, that's a place where you want to have a conservator look at that and see what they can do to stabilize that. OK, great. Um, and then I guess you know, metals that are located outdoors, uh, Stefana. Mm -hmm has brought up a gate, which I'm, I'm going to guess is, is either outdoors or on, on the outside of a building. So that's got mm -hmm. to be I mean, that's just can be very challenging. Um, she's in Miami, so uh, mm -hmm. she's got plenty of humidity, I'm sure. And salt. <laughs> and salt, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so in that case, um, she could consult with a conservator, um, but also probably someone in historic preservation could give advice on, um, right. on how right. To, they need to treat that gate too. Yes, because Protective. probably what they probably what they want to do is not just look at the gate. They're probably going to want to look at all the exterior metal. They'll probably also want to look at the interior metal, um, particularly depending on what kind of environment there is. Um, and in a case like that, where you're in an aggressive environment like Miami, you're going to want to try to work rather than looking at a single artifact. You're going to want to try to develop a long-range preservation plan for the whole institution. It's going to be a lot more cost-effective to do that than it is to try to piecemeal treat one object after another. You really need to look at that from a holistic perspective. So again, that's where I would suggest they have a conservator come and consult with them, or as you say, a historic preservation specialist. Um, that that's probably the best way to to address that problem because yeah. it's going to be a long term project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, good. We're just about at time, so if anyone has a last question they want to put in the chat box, um, please do it now. We will. Um, we've recorded this webinar, and we will be posting it on the website. You are no longer muted. We'll file it under care of metals in the topics menu. And um, I will also be um, doing a little more research on some of the materials we talked about, um, the calcium, a source for calcium carbonate that you know might be you could buy in a smaller quantity, and some of the other, other materials. And I will put, uh, put that up in the discussion area. Uh, so it looks like Denise asked us one more question on swords. Um, and I guess that could be a different types of metals. And then as we mentioned, maybe even different types of metals within the same object mm -hmm. um, yeah, or different materials. Options. Yeah. 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 It could be all of those things. Um, those are things where uh, often swords will have. <laughs> leather scabbards or uh, things like that that will inhibit your ability to use a really low relative humidity environment. Um, 
So that's a place where you want to, um, again, try to work with somebody who can, who can give you a sort of larger overview of your whole group. Usually, people don't have one sword if in their collection. Often, they'll have multiple. And so it, it might be a place where you might want to look at it as a part of a larger whole. It's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, especially then you could maybe develop housing for the swords that are not on display or yes. you know, yes. better display um, options to minimize right. the impact of the environment. Right. Right, okay. and keeping things clean, protected. Right, right. OK, one last question from Lincoln. Um, they're wondering, is there anything they can do for deteriorating ferrous metal without sending them to a conservator? I mean, beyond temperature and humidity control. Yeah. Keeping them as clean as possible. Um, but relative humidity and temperature control are really major components of long-term care of ferrous metal. So when you say clean as possible, it would be out of any kind of um, keeping them in a dust-free yes, environment? Yes, away from any sources of pollutants to the extent possible, and keeping the surfaces clean. So keeping them um, protected in housing boxes or you know, keeping them covered so that dust doesn't settle on them and um, things like that. So. But it, it, it's true, it is a difficult problem um, to have to take care of all these things when you can see them deteriorating in front of you. But doing those holistic things, keeping the environment clean, keeping the relative humidity low to the extent possible. Um, and with the ferrous metal collection, they may have a little bit more latitude to keep the relative humidity lower than you might normally keep it if you had a more mixed group of artifacts. So, right. And um, in, in sort of, if you do need to dust it, mm -hmm. uh, what you use some type of? Um, Usually, when you dust metals, you you want to stay away from dust cloths. You want to use soft, clean, natural bristle brushes, um, like uh, paint brushes, things like that, um, with soft bristles. And make sure you wash those bristles periodically so that as they collect dust, you can wash it away. Um, and then I, I like to dust regularly if you can get a, if you have the staff and you can accomplish it uh, on a monthly or quarterly basis. Um, again, this is a place where having filters in your HVAC system can help you because they can collect that dust that would otherwise fall on your artifacts. So trying to get uh, holistic systems to help you do your job is, is always an efficient way to work. Right. And I'll just say, you know, in terms of um, it can be daunting to think that you do need a conservator to help you with so many different objects in your collection. And so if anyone hasn't participated in just the general assessment of their entire collection and their environment, um, that is a really good um, way to prioritize your resources. So if you have several thousand dollars to spend with a conservator starting with one of those assessments um, to just get a general idea of what your priorities should be and what some holistic changes you can make, what kind of impact that would have on all of your collections, whether it's in storage or on display. Um, and I know that's something, Debbie, that you offer at the Gerald Ford Center. We do. As one of your services. And we do. at other regional conservation centers across the country. Um, you can also, when you look at the AIC website, the, the one I had, the slide I have up right now, that is an option to look for when you go into their find a conservator search tool. That a general assessment is something um, that you can select to look for someone in your area who does those types of things. And then Heritage Preservation actually has a program um, that's funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services called the Conservation Assessment Program. Now, it is limited to museums and historical societies. Uh, libraries and archives are not eligible for our program. But um, conservation assessment program, um, you can find it on our website, is one way to have that 
um, substantially funded. Um, some of the other regional conservation centers have some funding to support or help you know, subsidize the cost of an assessment. And then through the National Endowment for the Humanities, they have preservation assistance grants. And that libraries and archives can apply to, and again, for a general assessment. So um, it's a good way to just get an overview of what you're, you might need a conservator for in the future and what sort of things you can handle uh, begin to handle on your own. Yeah, those can really be helpful for not only for helping the collection staff to figure out what they can do and what needs to be done by someone else, but it can also help with your long-term fundraising for the preservation aspects of your museum. Great. Well, thanks again, Debbie. Really appreciate your time today and your expertise. And just to tell everybody, um, when you go to the uh, Saving Your Treasures site, these are just some of the examples of um, links under their care of metal section. So this would get to um, a lot of the topics we talked to today if you're looking for some more information. And um, again, um, you are welcome to participate in our discussion. If there are questions you think of later and you want to toss it out to the group, um, and I can follow up um, to get answers for you as well. So thanks again for joining us. We are going to have another webinar on um, cold storage for photographs um, in a couple of weeks on July um, the 7th. So check the website for um, the time for that. And um, thanks so much for joining us today. And we hope to talk to you soon on the online discussions. Thank you very Take much. Care. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.